Welcome back. Aggie Nation powered by the Eagle, Aubrey Bloom, Robert Sesta. You can hit us up, 229-1939 is the text line. Let us know what is on your mind. So let's just let's just dive right into the text to see, and then we'll, I don't know, go from there. Whatever y'all want to text us, we'll, we'll talk about it. Like I said, lots to talk about. No. Lots of angles on this A&M team sure. right now, so we'll just, we'll just dive in. First text said, I think Kyle is a very good quarterback and better than Tannehill was at this stage of his college days. Uh, and has a pro career ahead of him. But if someone's offense only has success with scrambling Johnny-style quarterbacks, and I think Kyler would be the better fit. There's a little bit there. One, Tannehill hadn't really played quarterback yet, uh, and he was behind Gerard Johnson. If Gerard Johnson wasn't there and Tannehill was playing quarterback, would Allen be better? I don't know. We, we don't know that because Tannehill really didn't play until he was a junior. So um, kind of a little bit of an interesting situation there. I, I, the thing about Kyle is, is, is again, in a big game, he wasn't, wasn't very good. And I know some of that's on the offensive line and potentially some of it's on the running backs and potentially some of it's on the wide receivers. And we're not in there. We don't know what they're supposed to be doing. We don't have access to that much. But to me, he just doesn't look comfortable in big games. And he gets frustrated and then he tries to press a little bit. That turnover he had in the red zone was absolutely killer for AM in this game. You, you can't have the ball away from your body like that. I mean, you've got to see that. You've got to feel that coming. And I, I didn't think he was very good. And that makes it the fourth time this year that he wasn't very good. Uh, well, third and a half. He wasn't real good in the first half of the Arizona State game, but he kind of came back and was good in the fourth quarter. But he was terrible against Alabama. He was terrible against Ole Miss. And then he was not very good in this game. And I know that maybe there were some injuries. Maybe there was some other stuff. But my point at the end of the last segment is, if you're a and if you're a fan right now, you're not going into next season going, hey, everything else didn't work, but we, at least we've got Kyle Allen. You know, that's not what you're saying. Right now you're going, can someone beat out Kyle Allen, or is this the best we've got? I think that's the question now. He wasn't good, and you circled the turnover because one thing someone has preached the last half of the season is turnovers are the key. So a and at that point, certainly in the ball game they're about to score at least three points and when you're that in close proximity of all the defenders and he studied by film knowing that this is an attacking defense so they're going to be slapping at that ball just a bad play for Allen not to protect the football that play might have won the game we're never going to know but if Adam kicks the field goal I mean what three points would have done at that time for their confidence and this was an LSU team that was waiting to lose. I felt this was an LSU team waiting to lose. But getting back to the – I love the Texas point because I don't have a good answer for that because should they go more spread? And the fact is you have a mobile quarterback. Would that be – if if would, would they be better off? And I'm not saying necessarily Kyler Murray. Maybe we haven't seen him. I'm just saying they have a decision to make. Do they want to go – where they're at, tweak things a little bit, still going to be a 50-50 team? Or do they want to have a quarterback that could possibly run for 100 yards every game to complement that? That's some decisions they're going to have to make because could they go forward with both? Well, they probably maybe should have done that. See, I thought we might have saw some Kyler Murray Saturday night. We don't know if he's 100%. Uh, that's question. But once again, talking about all these questions that Kevin Sumlin – has to decide himself, not his staff. He needs to decide what kind of offense, what kind of quarterback are they going to have going forward? I think that's a legitimate question. Yeah, I mean, there's, again, there's a lot to, to unpack Man. at the quarterback position because, one, when Kyle did go down in that final series, it was Hubenak that came in and, and not uh, and not Murray. And, and I don't know that, frankly, Kyler had his chance and was even worse than Allen was. So... I don't know yeah, that I, I don't I know that that's necessarily where you're going either. Well, uh, and, I, and the thing for the thing for Murray, you got you got, right, right, right. That's and tough. that's what I was going to say. Murray is going to get better, and but the thing is, he, he showed some of the downside. He he scrambles against Auburn, he gets hurt, and then you lose him for the rest of the game. And that is the risk of of going to a, a mobile quarterback and a scrambler. If you're going to risk their health and you don't have another scrambler behind them then you're kind of back where you started anyway. So I, or, if I, I don't know. or if your scrambler's not physically like a Cam Newton or Tim Tebow that can take a beating. Kyler Murray cannot take a beating. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see, someone, uh, a few more. So John and Cypher said, uh, people are down on SPAV now, but one day we will all be singing his praises for converting us from a football school back to a basketball school. Long live the Wow. Wow. That's what John and Cypher said. Someone, someone had some, ch some cheer this weekend while I watched some of those games. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about basketball later, probably. Okay. Okay. If we might have to hold that until tomorrow. Yeah, that's cool. Trust, Hoops is coming. Yeah, um, you know, is not going anywhere. Yeah, well, yeah, people know me, know me enough to know that we're going to get to basketball eventually. Um, I, I like this text, and I like all the text, but this one especially. This, before we pick an OC or quarterback for the future, someone needs to decide who we want to be on offense. We I haven't agree. had an identity 100%. all year, and that needs to change. That is 100% true. a and has got to decide if they want to be an air raid, if they want to be a pro style, if they want to be a West Coast, if they want to be a spread run, a kind of a power spread, as people are starting to call it now. Whatever you want to be, I think it can work. I think any offensive system can work, but you've got to pick one. You can't dabble in a little bit of everything. And that's what it looked like to me a and was doing too much this year. A little too much hands in all the pies instead of just picking one that you like and going with it. Uh, someone said having young quarterbacks has nothing to do with wide receivers not blocking and the O-line standing around while the guy they're supposed to be blocking is jumping on the quarterback. But it's true too, the offensive line was a problem, certainly in this game, and it has been a problem all year. Uh, I agree with that one too. The offensive line is, like you said, where things have to start. And I don't know that it was a talent problem, or I don't know if it was a coaching problem, or if it was a development problem. There's three things there. And you and I looked at the same time. There was one play. I thought it was a screen. Saturday night that LSU sent four people against five blockers, and three guys got to Allen. And I'm saying, what happened? Now, maybe there was a screen. Maybe someone read something. But that play looked, and I go, wow, that, there's a problem. My am is having problems on offense. The line just – and I understand Eric Coach Les says, well, it's not one person, it's five. This year, a and five offensive linemen – a lot of times we're not seemingly on the same page to me when I was watching the game. And here, like I said, there's there's three things, and this goes into this is for any any position. And it's and the simple truth is that the media here at AM and most schools these days doesn't get to watch enough to even hypothesize on the problem, Correct. much less actually know the Correct. problem. But there's three things. You can either recruit great players, you can develop great players. And or you can run a great scheme, and I don't know which one of those three was the big fall down this year. You know, were they not coaching them up? Were they not good enough to start with, or was it the scheme? We have no idea, and that's the thing that someone's got to figure out this off season uh, is where that problem went on the offensive line. Uh, someone said, "Who do you, who would be the best OC that's attainable to bring in?" Also, do you see a shift away from the air raid? That's from Dave in Clear Lake. Attainable is an interesting word <laughs> because. I didn't think if this if you'd asked me the day after the LSU game last year if John Chavis was attainable, I said no way. But we didn't That's know what I said. we didn't know the behind the scenes over there at LSU. And as that month went along, all of a sudden it looked more and more attainable. And by January first, uh, he was the AM defensive coordinator. By late in the afternoon or whatever their bowl game was over, he was AM defensive coordinator. So right now, who's attainable? I don't know. Um, Here's the deal is, at this place right now, whether Spavitol saves his job or they go out and get somebody, you have to look at Texas A&M. What is available here? If you come in, whether you're – now, Chavis is the end of his career, so he's not going to go on and be a head coach somewhere. But you come in here and A&M rips out three double-digit win seasons in the next four years, you're gone. You could pick your ticket. You're, you know, if, you're, if you helped out – if you're one of the main two guys that make that happen, just look at the jobs you can get. You look at Kirby Smart, the jobs he's turned down. If an offensive coordinator comes in here, no matter who it is, and A&M has that kind of turnaround, you will be the next job coach at a Missouri, a Georgia, whatever's open. you be the next Tom Herman. Look at Tom Herman. If right. you do that at A&M, so when, we don't know what's available out there. Never say never, because John Chavis proved that last year. Yeah, the, the two things are that there's a, a great talent at Texas A&M. Uh, you're going to be on the biggest stage there is in the SEC West. Uh, and, you know, someone has a reputation of guys that have gone to be head coaches. We've seen that now whether or not they're having success, that's maybe a topic for another day. But at least has that, you, you know that opportunity is there. So there are probably guys that are attainable that right now you don't even think of. Guys that are potentially... Uh, head coaches somewhere that, that are you know either going to get fired over the next month or however that's going to go. 
the, the thing to me, and it's more important than speculating on every offensive coordinator in the country, is the second part of the question, and that's do you see a shift away from the air raid? I, I wouldn't think so. We talked about this after the game, and we talked about this on the way back yesterday, and that long drive from Louisiana, though not as long as the drive from Tennessee, but a relatively long drive. Still some, some roadblocks along yeah, the way. Yeah, some traffic on the way, but uh, is uh, a and personnel, if, if you want to get a guy in here as an OC, and granted, Spavano hasn't been fired yet, so as far as we know, he's still a and offensive coordinator. It could be. But, I said, but it, it is is more, you, they almost have to be a pass-first spread offense in some form or fashion, whether it's an air raid or whatever you want to call it or however they do it, just because of personnel. Their best personnel group is wide receivers. Their worst is probably running backs. And so, you know, I know that Keith Ford's going to be eligible next year, and they've got some guys coming in, but you, who knows how good they're going to be. I mean, we thought Brandon Williams was going to be the next great running back when he became eligible, and he spent last year playing corner. So uh, it's hard to say that for sure. If you're looking at this roster, though, you're saying the best personnel group, wide receivers. And you've got to find a way to use them. And I think you almost have to be a pass first spread. Now, whether that's exactly an air raid, I don't know, but I think they're kind of landlocked there. The other thing is someone is not, and this was my post game column, and I know some of you guys have read it, but the, the someone's not on the hot seat. He's not getting fired over here over the next month, but no. his seat is not cool either. He's not exactly entrenched for the next four years. So if you're an offensive coordinator looking to move up the ladder, and you're, say, uh, you know, more of a pro style or West Coast, and you know there's going to be a transitional period for that, this is not the job for you because a offense needs to be good next year or someone is going to be on the hot seat. And you don't want to hit your wagon to a guy that might get fired in a year or two. So I think they almost have to be just because, like I said, they don't have time for, you know, for, for – progress they've got to get a lot better right now and they've got to be better next season or someone will be on the hot seat and so i, I think they've got to get someone that fits the personnel they already have i don't think they can start recruiting to a whole different system all of a sudden they do have to have success now because as i've written several times someone did help himself by going 11 to the first year that's his standard he set and now he has slid down when you look at the ball games they're going to go to they've slipped down each year uh, expectations have kind of gone up, but yet they haven't been able to meet them. So now it's over. Next year, someone, 80% of the fan base, and textures, we love you, but I'm talking about the general fan base. Joe Blow's got to go out next year and say, hey, Adam's on their way. Now, what, what that entails, it might be eight wins next year. That schedule's tougher, or nine games. We don't know, but they've got to make improvement next year because I think if you – Survey all AM fans this year. I think it's average at best. I mean, it's a good season, it's okay, but it's not where they want to be. Well, so now you got to get better. Eight and four is not the problem. The record, I don't think, was the problem. It's that in three of those four, they got blown out. And, the and one of them was a bad team. One <laughs> yeah, of them won, was right, a bad team. Right. In three of the four, they got blown out, and Auburn just flat wasn't very good. So, like in you your said, place. Yeah. At home. And that, and that's the bigger problem. Eight and four would have been okay if they lose. If they lose on a last-second field goal to Ole Miss right. or, or to LSU or to Bama, or you know, it's the eight and four that you have. That's what I'm saying. Right. Eight and four next year could be could be fine, acceptable yeah. because you might lose somebody. You might, who knows? The SEC might have its best year in ten. This is not yeah. a good year for the SEC. And A and M was average on an average year for the SEC. Yeah. All right. We got to catch another break. We'll keep getting y'all's texts. Keep them coming. We're just going to go through them as we go along today. Uh, hit us up, 229-1939. It's Agonation, powered by the Eagle here on Sports Radio 1150, the Zone FM, 102.7.